guys, Saf here with another Raid Shadow Legends video, and in today's video, we are going to be talking about the mightiest of all champions, Mighty Uko. He has kind of got a lot of attention at the moment because of how powerful he has become in live arena. We always knew as creators he would be a very strong champion when he was a fusion. I can't remember exactly how long ago it was. It certainly feels like within the last 12 months. So probably a fair few of you who are watching might actually have this champion and you may or may not be using him. But if you aren't using him and you're struggling in live arena, he is an absolute monster for live arena content. In the video, we're going to be looking at his skill sets. We're going to be looking at how you can build him, the different options. We're going to be playing him in live arena so you can see him in action and you can actually see how I use the champion in live arena. And we'll be looking at other areas in the game where you might be able to get some value out of him and going into his sort of some of his details and technical things around how his passive actually works. But before we get into that, I'd like to thank Bloodlines Heroes of Lethas for sponsoring this video. I just want to talk about how fun this game is in this little bit of information. So thanks to Bloodline Hero of Lethas for sponsoring this video. In Bloodlines, you are charged with collecting powerful heroes and creating new unique hybrid heroes to become the next High Guardian of Lethas. Now, if you haven't already downloaded the game and you want to join me, you can use my link in the description below or you can scan the QR code and if you use that code, you will get yourself a free starter pack to power charge your game account. What makes Bloodline so unique is the ability for you to marry your heroes with companions in-game to create new, unique Bloodlines. You get a Bloodline every fortnight. That means there are over a thousand unique hybrid heroes you can create in the game using the companion system. It makes it one of the most diverse gacha gameplay experiences in the game. You can create Bloodlines from various different factions, including elves, dwarves, demigods, demons, you name it, it's a very unique, diverse experience. And not only that, it looks amazing. It's got some stunning 3D graphics. You can really get yourself immersed in a fantasy world and truly become the High Guardian of Lethas. There's also rewarding late game PvP content where you can get your hands on some uniquely designed hybrid champions called Bloodcraft Legends, which are really powerful and really cool. They were earned from seasonal guild wars, which is new to the game. I'm also having a lot of fun with the companion system, creating these bloodlines, but also building up my kingdom. There's an economic level and a bit of strategy involved in it as well, where you can basically build up your kingdom as you collect all these heroes and create new bloodlines. So I'm having a lot of fun with bloodlines. If you want to get involved as i said you can download the game for free on both android and ios if you use my link in the description or if you scan the qr code on the screen you'll get yourself a special starter pack which includes one summoning crystal a hundred thousand gold and 100 diamonds that's worth around about 20 dollars to your account once you've created your account, if you grab your account ID and username and put it in the comments below, the first 30 people who do that will get their hands on a free legendary orc champion, Ugral, which is one of the best warriors to carry you in the game. So thanks again to Bloodline Hero of Lethas for sponsoring this video. I'm really enjoying the game so far and I'm really excited to play with you guys and to continue playing the game. So let's get back to the video here now. So Mighty Uko, what makes Mighty Uko extremely special? Well, he has a couple of abilities that just make him extremely obnoxious to fight in the arena. First things first, his base stats are exceptional. He's got 18,500 HP pretty much, 1,112 defense and 109 base speed. He can go fast. He can be built with defensive capabilities. He's not really a damage dealer. You're not going to get any damage. So don't build him to do damage. He has a 20% aura in all battles. So universally, all battle aura speeds is Great for early game, great for mid game and late game, exceptionally powerful for things like clan boss and other areas like Hydra where regional targeted speed auras like dungeons and faction wars don't work. But what makes Mighty Uko unique is his A3 passive and his A2 ability. His A3 has a 50% chance of stealing one random buff from a random enemy each time a buff is placed on the enemy team. Will only attempt to steal one buff for each type of buff placed simultaneously. For example, only one random buff may be stolen if three shield buffs are placed at the same time. Any stolen buffs become protected. The last bit is actually quite important. The buff becomes protected. There was a lot of confusion when this champion came out as to exactly how this passive works. And I did a video on it, which I'll put in the card around about here where 
I actually spoke about the coded mechanics of this skill and I probably got a few details wrong myself, but I know that player and butchered like four different attempts to try and explain it. They even changed the description recently to swap shield out for veil. I don't particularly know why as, a, as an example, but they did. Just a little fun little quirk there. But essentially the way that this works, if an enemy buffs, I have a chance to steal a buff. Anytime they buff again, I have another chance to steal a buff. I can keep stealing buffs. I've even seen this do some silly things like the enemy has stone skin, they've placed shield buff, I've stolen the stone skin and protected the stone skin. It is an obnoxious passive to actually fight sometimes because it completely throws the thing out of the game where basically you can just keep like messing up with RNG, you can steal buffs. I've seen it do some silly things like it always stole the increased attack off my win condition. So my, my Nuka lost half of his damage. It's really, really powerful. This is a totally unique passive. It doesn't exist on any other type of champion in the game in this fashion. The other thing that makes him extremely strong is his A2 ability. He is on a four turn cooldown, attacks all enemies two times. Each hit has a 75% chance of remo removing two random buffs from the target. So it's a four buff removal. And then if there are no buffs after you attack, he places block buffs and decrease accuracy. This is exceptionally good for Hydra if there are no poison clouds out. There is a condition there, obviously, if it's a poison cloud, a poison cloud is a buff, you can't then get it out. But if there is no poison clouds out there, then he becomes a block buff and a decrease accuracy champion, and he can remove anything that does get stolen. He's really, really powerful for that. In Arena, this just becomes incredibly good into the high buff meta. The only thing you have to be careful of is obviously Polymorph. He is susceptible to being sheeped. So you've got to keep that in mind when you're drafting in live arena or when you're doing any particular content that in, in arena, if you're up against a high polymorph team, you don't really want to use Uko for that effect because it's going to be a bit of a problem. You are going to lose your Uko to a sheep effect more often than not. In addition, he's got an AoE A1, 75% chance of placing decrease attack. That's really strong, especially for early to mid game progression. You put him in a sort of control sets and he will just keep your team flowing. Decrease attack is one of the best ways to stay alive early game. And even in arena, sometimes just getting the ability to put an AoE decrease attack out on un protected champions because you've stolen block buffs off them can mean the difference between getting one shot from a Jorgid and not getting one shot from a Jorgid. He also, to add to all the rest of his kit, has a revive for all allies. He can use this ability though even if there are no dead allies. So for an, an arena defense meta, not live arena, but like tag team defense, classic arena defense, this is not so desirable because he will probably do this nearly all the time and you can't really get as much value out of it. But when you revive them, they come back with 40% HP and block damage. So it's quite good as long as you're not facing something like a Rotus or a Buff Stripper, like an, an opposing Uko, to get your team back and guarantee them to get a turn. That's on a four turn cooldown. You also get increased speed as well, if that's the case. He's a speed demon. You know, in Hydra, you can basically keep using this ability to give yourself AoE increased speed. AoE decrease attack, AoE block buffs, AoE decrease accuracy, Hydra S tier, Live Arena S tier. Not really that valuable, I would say, for Clan Boss. I think there are better options, but could be used if you do need to, to build that kind of 4-3 speed buff ratio. There are options there. Very good for progression-based, carrying you through dungeon waves. Probably very good for dealing with things like Ice Golem. AoE decrease attack is very, very valuable in Ice Golem because the boss hits so hard. And yeah, so those are the areas I would say he's really good. And obviously Faction Wars, he's probably going to be a hard carry because it's an AoE revive. So let's just have a look as to how I have built him. And I've built him in the way that I am I think a lot of end game sort of high end players are playing the game at the moment. Although there are better ways to build it than I have built it because my my gear for certain things are limited. So for a blessing, I've got a one star soul. I've chosen Polymorph. I think that's actually a very good option. Another great option is Life Harvest at the moment. If you're facing lots of revivers, Life Harvest is absolutely like it's so strong. The more chances he gets turn meter back, the more he can A2, the more he can A1, the more he can just like cycle. It becomes really difficult to deal with a high awakened Life Harvest champion. But certainly at a lower awakening, Polymorph is better, especially with Mighty Uko in this build because I've gone Fearsome Presence. So this 5% chance is a 10% chance. So it's a lot more likely to happen. Other Blessings, you could go Temporal. They're not really worth it. You could go the Aura if you want. I don't think it's worth it. You could go Cage if you want. But again, his passive is going to protect the buffs anyway. So it's kind of a waste of time. So definitely I would say either Polymorph or Life Harvest for Mighty Uko. I'm on a one star, so I've gone the Polymorph route. So you can see here, I've got him booked on the A3 and the A2. I should probably book his A1 eventually, 
but I just haven't got the books at the moment. And I have built him in stun set. So the idea what we want to do with Mighty Uko when we go into Live Arena is we want to just permanently control the enemy because stun sets don't require accuracy. So those Mithralas that you can never debuff, those Siffies that have like four, five, six hundred resistance, all those champions you don't need accuracy for, you can control them and you can break the flow of battle. You can stun those Nukas before they can get a turn and you can guarantee it because you can take away the block buffs uh, the, the, the block debuffs off the Nukas specifically. You may not be able to build enough accuracy on him to be able to take away from the high resist champions, but that's not so important. So I currently have him in a 280 speed, 352 accuracy. In an ideal world, he'd be faster and he'd have probably another 50 accuracy. Like in an ideal world, I'd be up to like 310, 320 speed and probably about 400 accuracy but you need to have some level of survivability on your mighty uko he cannot be glass cannon that's why i've got him at 70,000 hp here and 3.5k defense but i have a lot more survivability to come on my champion because i will be fully ascending his gear we are going to get another 11 percent defense here we're going to get another 17 percent defense here 11 percent hp we're going to get some flat stat defense along here. This flat stat defense equals a primary stat ring. Don't underestimate the value of flat stat ascension. This is 83 times over, 320 defense. That's more than a ring would give me. So that's what we've got him here. We've also opted to go into revenge accessories here. In, in an ideal world, I'd have like a refresh potentially, or maybe one reaction. But the revenge is actually very good because if you can get counterattacks going, you can get the stun set activations. So it actually adds a lot of value. So the idea is you go in, you probably A2, clear off any buffs. Obviously, you can't place block buffs against a, um, a bolster set. So bolster kind of hard counters this ability to stop out the skills. But if there's a normal shield, you've got any sort of debuffs, block buffs, block debuffs, you name it, they've got it. You just wipe it away and then you start stun locking people. The better option here is actually Provoke Set, because Stun is only an 18% chance, whereas Provoke is actually a 30% chance. Provoking might kill your Uko, but it's a more chance to control, so it's less likely to cause you problems. Stun will guarantee that you don't take any damage, but it's obviously a lot less chance. Now, if you haven't caught my video yesterday, definitely go check it out, because we were talking about the stun and provoke and toxic sets chance of activation and how actually the, the description from Playroom's guides is incorrect. And it's actually important for Uko here because Uko on his A2 actually attacks with two effects one time. So even though he attacks twice, he technically has two individual single attacks, which means he has two chances of proccing the stun set. So this means that this stun set isn't just one times 18% on the A2, it's actually two times 18%. So nine times out of 10, even if there are no buffs out, you probably always want to open with A2 unless you know you're about to get heavy buffed and you can't guarantee some sort of control because you just have a lot more chance to actually land that stun set. I explained it more in detail in the video yesterday. If I go into it now, it will actually just make this video longer. So definitely go check that out. So that's how I've built him. In Masteries then, I've basically just gone Fearsome Presence. I do always take Wisdom of Battle because that stops Siffy from sleep cycling you. You get a chance to get Block Debuffs when you get slept. It means you can slow down the Siffy and at least get a turn. We've gone for Cycle of Magic to try and get the A2 back. And then I'm just going down for counterattack. I haven't quite decided whether I'm going to go for Cycle of Revenge or whether I'm going to go for Deterrence. And I haven't quite decided if I'm going to go for Spirit Haste or maybe go for some Lasting Gifts or uh, Master Hexer. I feel like Spirit Haste because he's a Reviver makes more sense. So those are the final Masteries we're going to get. And as I said, he's still got room for growth because we need to get more Oil Ascension. So let's take him for a spin in the main area, which I kind of want to show him off here is live arena i'm at around about 1445 live arena now so we're going to find a fight now for mighty uko we're going to see if we can build one um, as i said i'm about like mid-range so sometimes i find a big opponent sometimes i don't what have we got here looks like we've got potentially a bit of a, a stronger opponent here 1448 he's around the same rating as me doesn't really matter ratings at the moment it depends what people have in their roster some people decided to climb really early. Some people have just done their 10 a day and it's taken a while to climb. It's going to take a month for this live arena to restabilize, I think. So I'm drafting this type of team. I'm drafting double win condition. You need a win condition. You have to have two. If I only drafted Constantine, they just ban the Constantine and I can't win. This is a pretty like nasty team for us to test this against. 
So I've got a tricky situation to decide here. I could take out the Rotus and try and avoid dealing damage to the Leorius. Obviously, Uko is going to AoE. So that's what I'm going to do because actually the Rotus passive is the biggest hard counter to this team because I actually can't kill him in one shot with Vlad and I have to rely on the A2 or an A1 debuff, which I don't really have an awful lot with the double block debuffs here. So we are in the Oreo of Doom. It looks like a giant Oreo. I can't unsee it now that I've seen it. Obviously, we see there, we've already stolen the strength and buff. We've now stolen speed, increased attack, and increased defense. So we've stolen three. So my options are here. There's lots of buffs out. I can't actually get away from the bolster, but I'm just going to see if I can start taking away some things. I need to strip like the block buffs. Can I get any stuns? Okay, I didn't get any stuns that time. Pretty bad luck. But you can see the counterattacks. That's the first wave of attacks. We expect Leorus to be pretty strong. We are going to get sleep cycled from the Siffy. But we can do a revive. The only thing is the Leorus has got another revive. But we have a backup revive here. The fact we stole increased defense means this Uko is going to be a bit more tanky than normal. So he's back awake. That's the value of that blessing. We now can't get slept again because we've got one turn to actually be able to do that. He's going to A2 again. I don't understand why he didn't A2. He should have probably A2'd. Because now I can come back in here and I can probably start doing some stuff. We probably just take away some turn meter. Try and breach some shield. We can't really get any sort of sleep. But we probably just want to take out the Necro because he's protecting a lot of people right now. So we need to start to take out the Necro first. Then we need to take out the support. Then we need to be able to one shot because we're still waiting out the bolster shields. The bolster shield takes three turns for it to expire. They're starting to expire now. And our damage dealers just don't have the capability of breaking through ally protection. We survive the AoE because we've got Valent and AoE decreased defense. And now Vlad is going to get going. This is the risk with Leorius. <laughs> we didn't quite proc his passive. So we're now in a bit of a, a spot of bother. So we can probably revive, get an increased speed buff, keep the Vladimir alive. Don't know whether that's a mistake. So far, we haven't had any stuns. I've just been really unlucky. We've got to kill this Leorius. Now, Constantine does have an A3 to steal unkillable, but I don't think he's got it available to him. He's at risk of losing this now if my Constantine has an ability and he can one-shot the Leo. That was a bad mistake. This is the interesting thing about Live Arena. He chose to try and kill the Reviver when actually he should probably have killed the Nucus because now that I've got Constantine, I've actually block revived his Nuka. So the only way I lose this is if I actually can't get a turn on Duchess, which is possible because of the Siffy sleep cycling. This is where that blessing comes in real handy. He's made another mistake because he's targeted the Duchess when he shouldn't have. So this is all about misplays. This guy is misplaying the fight because he's allowing my Nukas to, to take control of the fight, which is, I suppose, what's different about live arena to normal arena. Normal arena, the bot would have probably just A2 and he's lost that because he should have just killed my aunt, my Nukas. But Uko was not a great example there. We didn't really see the value of Uko because we didn't get any stuns. We didn't get any control. We got really bad RNG and that's kind of like the negative side of this build. It doesn't guarantee that you're going to be able to get stuns. It just, you could see that he was influencing the battle by stealing buffs and being a nuisance. Now, some things to note, you want to kind of hide your mighty Uko in live arena. Don't first pick him because if you first pick him, he does have some natural counters. Mortu Macabre is the one that comes to mind. If you AOE all the time on an A2 and an A1, then obviously you have a very high chance you're going to activate Peril. So you want to kind of, like you can see, I'm drafting different champions later. I want Necret to always be last in my turn order because the Necret passive will guarantee if I actually take a big AOE nuke, it might keep my, my actual DPS alive that's protected by him because he has the passive and it's all based on like team order. So the damage is done in team order. The damage to the champion first means it activates the passive before Necret dies. Then I get a big shield and they probably survive. I'm hiding the Uko to last pick so that I don't get counter drafted with a Mortu. These types of teams I really struggle with because I have to ban the Warlord otherwise I don't get to play the game. But at the same time, he's got a Kaima, which is going to do double Baron Nuke. I could take the Arbiter out to try and reduce the increased attack, but it's a plus four Rodas. So I feel like no matter what I do here, I lose. Now, unless his Kaima is slower, this is going to be a bit of a, a loss. This t this type of team is what I, my account really struggles against because I just don't know how to beat these like double lockout reset type of champion setups. Because it doesn't matter if I ban the Kaima or the Warlord, I'm not going to get a turn. Like the Warlord's so fast, I'm probably going to lose all my turn meter unless I get a good counterattack. Maybe this video will never see the value of stun set because he's never going to do it. 
that potentially could be the video as well. My Duchess is about to die because I lost stone skin. It's a calamity of bad RNG. We don't get to do anything. It's over, I think. Oh, well, we got one stun. So here's the value of that revenge stun. The only thing is we can't really do anything. So it's, it's a loss. So, you know, these, these are the things. This is why Live Arena to some extent is fun, but also not fun. You're seeing that Uko can have value, but against just hard lockout, you can't really do much. If a champion, if a, if a person's got a roster where they've got Warlord Yumiko, and they've got a Kaimar in there, and they've got the Siffy Rotus Baron, it's, it's, you can't really ban that out. You have to outpick it. And if you haven't got the champions yourself, you can't really outpick it. I had to try and ban the Arbiter to take away the increased attack because I couldn't ban the Rotus and the, the Baron. Let's see if we can find a fight that actually shows off this build. So far, all the fights that I've done on this this window, like the Uko has just been outdrafted and the RNG has not been in our favor. It is an RNG build. It's not always going to pay off for you, but it could actually clutch you out. The amount of times I faced an Uko and he has just like decimated my ability to win because he just keeps locking out my nuclear or something. And then when I use it, it doesn't happen. It's just like the nature of the beast. This is martial ed era all over again. If anyone has ever faced fear in the arena, it is basically, you know, your fears never work. The enemy fears always seem to work. As a five-star Rodus, what, are, what else are we going to draft here? The Uko is what I'm going to try and draft here as the last pick. I do feel like this uh, arena timer for the picking could be halved. Like it takes so long for people to pick champions. You don't need like 60 seconds and they've gone more to. So I can choose to keep the more to in. It is probably a bit of a risk because, you know, if I he's probably in stone skin or I can take the Rotus out. I'm probably just going to take the Rotus out if I'm being honest, because I think I can probably deal with the more to macabre. But it's, this is where I'll, this is kind of a good example of how he is a counter. If he, if he gets going... There's a risk that I could just lose. It's not a stone skin Mortu, which kind of helps because it means that he's not going to instantly be un untargetable for two turns. He's probably going to A2 here just to get going. We do have block buffs. Block buffs are not great. You can see I've got counter attacks. But now we're going to come in with our abilities. We're going to take away stuff. We're going to stun one target. There is no cleanse. So that means that stun is going to go through. We probably want to AoE just to basically drop some turn meter and get some control of the fight. That block buffs on our Mighty Uko is kind of frustrating. And also, we didn't get rid of the block buffs off the Mighty Uko. So, uh, off the, the Mortu Macabre. So, we're kind of in a spot of bother here. We can't really kill anyone just yet. But let's just see what we can do to this Duchess here. Vlad is low-key can be very strong. He's, he's one of those people don't really think he's that strong a champion, but he can be. There's the Peril coming out. This is the risk with having... Mighty Uko in your team against a Mortu. He does hard counter Mighty Uko. So normally if you see a Mortu come out and you're using Mighty Uko here, you ban the Mortu. I'm using this as an example to show you. We might as well just keep AoE. We probably lost this fight again because of not really getting the stun set out. You do need to get these block debuffs out. The, the, the sleep cycling from Sifri is going to start coming in. Let's see what else he's got. We may be able to clutch it. Vlad, when he gets going, if we can get some kills... And we can get his life harvest rocking. We might be able to clutch it. Then again, he's just got peril over and over again. So that's an example of why you should ban Mortu Macabre against Mighty Uko. We've got our refills. We're not doing very well today. That's three in a row that we've lost. We're just getting out rostered a little bit. Now, what I have noticed, by the way, is if you lose three in a row, you get a bot. Look at the difference in matchmaking here as an example. I could literally draft any team that I want here. Because he's going to pick five random champions because this is a bot. There's no way that I get match made up against someone with this much point difference and this level difference. The only the only factor that's happened here is I've lost three in a row. And I've seen this a few times before. So I think the rule set is basically to keep you motivated to play in the game. If you lose three in a row, you get a bot. As you can see, they're drafting like starter champions. These are not champions you see in live arena at silver. They, they're just not. We'll go through it and I kind of like we'll see what it is and then we'll move on to the next fight. As you can see, this is not a high-end team. Like it's this is a bot. I'm basically gonna one-shot it because he'll not be built. It always bans your leader. As to whether this is a good thing or a bad thing, I'm I'm I i do not really have an opinion. I think generally though, if people feel like they can't progress, they'll stop playing the game mode, and that's probably a negative. So having a free win every so often probably keeps people motivated to play in the game mode. And live arena more than anything else is dependent on people playing the game mode. So let's just clear this out and we'll jump to one more or two more fights.
So we've lost the bot. Let's see if we can find a fight that we can actually test this Mighty Uko build. It's been a pretty rough session so far. I've, I've had a few fights that I've just not been able to uh, to properly show how you use Mighty Uko in Arena just because I'm getting out rostered a little bit. Let's see what we've got here. The Warlord first pick normally screams instant ban. It's a lot of Warlord Kaimoth combos. Let's just pick him and Necret. And then the wind conditions are going to come in. What have they got for wind conditions? Is it going to be a Baron, Trunder, Hefrak, Jorgid? Rotus, Siffy. It's probably going to be one of those lots. Maybe a Harima. We might see a Taras make an appearance. Come on. This pick this pick turn just is too long. Okay, it's a, a Skull Crown and a... Okay, that's interesting. I feel like we have to take away the Warlord. Just because the Warlord is too strong. The Warlord does just too many things. He does block debuffs. He does lock you out. You know, I can... I was debating between the Duchess and the Warlord, but the Warlord is just too strong. So let's see if we actually get any turns or whether we're just going to get slept, controlled, and nuked. That's the key thing here. So it's a fast Duchess. He's going to put it into an A2, which is absolutely fine. We steal one of the block buffs. Probably going to get thing. But that does mean... This is the this is the value of the power. We can actually showcase some of his kit. Because he was able to steal a block buffs, block debuffs... He protected that. That denied the Kaima from being able to sleep. Now I can return with an A2, and I can probably get some control in. I've stunned the Skull Crown. I've taken away his increased attack. We did lose both of our Revivers. That's really a strong Foley. We've lost because of the Foley. I mean, that's just like insane damage. I mean, he didn't have any attack at all. Can't really do anything here now, so we've probably lost. But you can see, like, if we just keep A1, you can see the value of the, the build here. We can just keep stun locking the Skull Crown. If we had not lost both of our nukers, this would be a great win condition. But because we have, we kind of can't win this because there's no way we're going to be able to do any, any sort of damage, unfortunately. So the Foley somehow managed to kill me. My, my Constantine had reaction. So it wasn't like they weren't well built. But that's the value of the passive there. We'll do one more fight, see if we can actually find a fight we can win rather than having fights we keep losing. And then I'll kind of show him off in other places as well, um, just to show you the value of how you can carry through different wave content and various different things. But that is the value of the passive there. It actually denied the Kaim off being able to control him. Had we got a bit more luck and we were able to control and stop the nuke coming at us, we probably would have survived. So we're going for a Tormin straight away here, which is an interesting pick. I don't really see Tormin picked in the meta an awful lot. Very good as a counter if someone is just drafting speed team because you can take away the block debuffs and deny them if you've got him. I obviously don't have a Torment, so that's not a strategy that I can use. What are we going to follow that up with? So we've got a Kaimar Warlord. You're starting to see a little bit of the elements of the video that I released a couple of, like last week, where I started feeling frustrated with the arena meta because it is the same champions over and over and over again. Barring a few examples here, Every single fight is basically Warlord Kaimar something something. Warlord Kaimar something. It's getting really quite stale, I would say. And it is something that gets, like, especially if you're in a bit of a, a, a cycle like today where I'm fighting the same teams and not really being successful, you start really getting demoralized about being able to compete. This is why actually having Warlord would have been a big deal for my account because I can offer something up that is equally must bannable, where a lot of my champions are not must bannable, but they do have a big impact. So the Tormund's going to come out. Is it a damage Tormund? Is it a control Tormund? Based on his speed, potentially. Like, he's been she sheeped. Now, can we get some stuns? No. That didn't work, unfortunately. So the Rotus is going to start killing people. We basically can't play the game right now. And we're probably going to lose because we can't play the game. Because the Kaimar is going to power cycle. He's going to do that. He's going to kill my only reviver, which is Uko. We did get a stun. This is the value of the stun set now. You can see we're probably going to get slept. Uko can basically keep power stunning, hopefully. It might give us enough time to take a turn. It might not. Uko is basically dead. So it's a one-hit wonder team now. We're basically, can we get Constantine? But the fact we were able to get some stuns and actually get some control might give us the opportunity for Constantine to one-shot and win this. Let's find out. No, because the sleep. Kaima is OP. Oh, it's so frustrating, isn't it? Oh, how did we wake up? 
Someone in comments, tell me how we woke up there. Because waking up has actually won me the fight. I've no idea how we woke from that. Bugs galore. Let's do one more, the final token for this window, and then we will show him off in some other content so you can see the value of this champion. So we've got someone with a Marichka portrait. Doesn't necessarily mean they're a Kraken. What's the first pick? It was a weird pick to pick the Torment. I feel like the Torment wasn't that valuable. Especially first pick. You want to be all you want to be scary on your first pick. I don't really think of Torment. Like if you show Torment, you kind of force me away from a speed team instantly. Whereas Torment is much more powerful as a counter to a speed team. Like for example, now if he builds like boost into boost into nuke, I could just draft Torment and, and mess up with his his rotations. That would be a good counter. It would probably result in the Torment being banned, but then I can at least pick with four champions knowing exactly what I'm walking into because he's shown his hand quite early. That doesn't necessarily mis mean it's not a full nuke R, but like, this is going to be a a really difficult team. We are going to struggle with this team. Ooh, because the Romantu has to be banned. We're going to have to ban the Romantu because he's just way too strong. But the Supreme Elhane, if she gets debuffs, if they draft further debuffs, we could be in trouble because I can't ban away the, de the debuffs. Then again, it's only a level 52 Supreme Elhane, so it's not full damage. So probably not fully built. And they're also drafting the Uko. So we, I think we we take away the Arbiter. As crazy as it sounds. Because I feel like if they haven't got increased attack and they don't have their aura bonus, the El Hain and the Candy are not as strong. The only risk is we've left Roman to open and it becomes who goes first. And it's a full stone skin team. So we're going to have to try and steal some stone skin. We got two away. Didn't get any stuns. It's very depressing. Now we can just see what, like, let's just see what we can do. We lose the passes, but they, he's going to have to revive if he wants to do anything. I can't actually do anything for three turns because of block debuffs or block buffs. And now his Uko has kind of got control of the fight. Actually killing me was probably the best thing there because it got rid of the buffs, believe it or not. Sometimes dying is the best form of defense here. Dying meant I could actually do that. Life harvest kicking in. The value of life harvest is, is massive. It's given me an extra turn. I can now lock him out. The value of life harvest is also very good. And I've won that because of that. Now, I wouldn't necessarily say Uka was the cause of that, but you can see having that revive with block damage, then they have to revive. It meant that I won that fight. So that's Mighty Uka on the live arena. It's very difficult to play test and show it on a video. Check out my live streams if you want to see me use it in a more practical setting because I can actually show you all the different fights that I fight. This is going to have to be edited into a bit of a shorter video. Otherwise, you're going to get bored of watching it. But in other places, he is very strong as well. If you want him to wave control in a stun set, you can do that. So if you're in a progression state and you're building towards Dragon 20, for example, obviously I've got nuke teams. I don't need to do that. But you can bring Mighty Uko in here as your speed lead aura. And you could bring someone like a Kale if you had him. I don't think I have a Kale built. But I could use someone like a Dark Kale here as a Poisoner or Venomage is a good example. You can bring in someone that's got an AOE decreased defense to try and help you get through the waves. Someone like a Stagnite, someone like a Deacon. I think I've got a Stagnite here somewhere. Let's have a look. Let's just let's just draft kind of like what I would say, you know, someone who is early in the game. Something like my free to play would have like the Mistrider Dithy or the Deacon. You can start pretty much any account with a Deacon here uh, if I can find him in this kit. So you can have someone like this for a, sort of a live thing. You'll see here, you get the speed buff. And obviously, Deacon will come in and he'll do the AOE decrease to defense. And then we're just kind of like working our way through the waves. The stun set's working for you. It's basically keeping the, the waves controlled. And you've got to back up revive there. So Uko is not ever going to be at risk of dying because he's built quite tanky. Now, obviously, my gear here is going to be stronger than a starter account. It's very difficult for me to showcase this champion as a progression champion because I, I don't keep hold of five-star gear anymore. But this is a concept you can run. And you can see how comfortably he's controlling the wave. And then Elhane would be kind of like your starter champion, right? If you were running kill, you wouldn't need to run a poisoner. And we've got Vogoth in here just for like healing. But you can see basically he is here to just keep controlling the wave. The value of an AoE A1 on a champion in a progression setting is incredible. It's why Bellaware was always famed to be one of the best champions in the game earlier on because he was a rare champion that had multiple aoe's you just put him in a stun set and he permanently controlled the wave so we're just going to get through to the boss here and you can see like the wave is never touching us because they never get a turn to pull never get a chance to play the game and then when we get to the boss the poisoners are going to come in and take over as well 
the decreased accuracy as well as a hidden OP little thing, like being able to drop the enemy's accuracy means you're not taking effects, you're not taking drop defense, you're not taking the poisons that you're going to get off the dragon here. You're not taking all those effects, so you can actually help keep your team alive even further. Venomage is going to put the heal reduction up here and also the poisons, and he's just going to keep cycling. He, he carries your team. The increased speed buff will help you get around to your abilities again, and the boss doesn't get to do its fire breath mechanic. So that is Uko in kind of like a progression sense of how I would use him. It's kind of like the same build. You would just build him probably, you know, his stats are not going to be as high. He's not going to need to go 280 speed. You could do this at 200, 250 speed as well. It would be absolutely effective because you can see once he gets the control set with fearsome presence, he's pretty dominant. And there you have it. Finishes there. Not built for damage. Even in Hard Dragon, you could probably get away with stealing the increased attack buff on his passive, for example, because he plays it on himself. He has a, probably a 50-50 chance he'll steal that initial increase attack. So that is Mighty Uko. I think if you haven't built him yet and you are interested in progressing in Live Arena, although this video didn't necessarily showcase it in a very good detail because the fights were very difficult, I mean, quite high up, it's, you know, it's difficult to actually show him off in, in that setting. He does make or break some arena fights. Like he was winning some of those fights that I probably would have lost without him. So he's definitely a champion you should invest in. Let me know in the comments below if you are already using Mighty Uko. How are you finding him? How have you built him? Have you built him similar to me? Have you built him in a different way? Let me know in the comments below. If you've liked this video, please consider giving our channel a subscribe and hit that bell notification. And all of our videos will go straight into your feed. We do lots of deep diving into the game information. I do monthly patch note breakdowns. We live stream on a Monday and a Thursday at 8 p.m. UK time where we'll do different things like Hydra content, Live Arena, Gear cleansing is probably the next one I need to do. And I've also got cool videos coming out in the next couple of days on the Razzle Varg Fusion. But yeah, thanks for watching, guys. And I will catch you in the next video.